بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله تعالى من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Today inshallah we're going to be looking at the 11th juz of the Quran and we mentioned yesterday that Surah At-Tawbah it continues on into the 11th juz of the Quran and it covers the first portion of the 11th juz and thereafter we have Surah Yunus which makes up the rest of the 11th juz of the Quran we mentioned yesterday that Surah At-Tawbah what is one of the themes of Surah At-Tawbah who remembers from yesterday No one's listening to my dogs. No, that's in, that's in Surah Al-Anfal. What else? Hunayn and? The Battle of Tabuk. Yes, the Battle of Tabuk. We have to remember this stuff, yeah? Insha'Allah. Right, the Battle of Tabuk. Now, why was the Battle of Tabuk difficult? It was far away, far location, it was very hot, it was a time of difficulty. And the Prophet ﷺ, he warned the companions beforehand to prepare in advance. Now, because it was a difficult battle, we had the munafiqun who were playing up, yeah, because they did not want to take part in this battle. So they started coming with all sorts of excuses. Yeah. So Allah Azza wa Jal at the end of the tenth Jews he talks about this that Waja al Mu'adhiruna min al Arab. That all the the, the people who were wanted excuses, they started coming to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so that permission is granted to them that they can stay behind and not take part in the battle. Allah Azza wa Jalla speaks about those people who only those people who are Du'afa, Laysa ala Du'afa wala al Marda, wala ala Ladina la yajiduna ma yunfiquna haraj. Allah says only the weak people, those people who are very sick, and those people who don't have the means and the expenses to take bath part in the battle only those people are permitted to stay back right and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that it's not regarding the people who have everything but they're just making other excuses yeah they're making excuses like they're, they're faking it that they're sick right so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he mentions the attitude of the believer is that um, when they find out that they don't have anything that they can take to their battle Right? And they don't have any expenses, they don't have a ride, they don't have weaponry, they don't have anything that will allow them to reach Tabuk. Allah Azza wa describes the quality of these people. Allah says that the believers are those people that when they say, right, La ajidu ma ahmilukum when you say, O oh Muhammad, that I cannot find anything that you can take with on the battle, which means that you can't take part in the battle because you don't have anything with you. That they turn away from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in a manner that they are crying because they are missing out on this great opportunity. Right? So Allah is mentioning the difference in the attitude of the believers and the munafiqun. The munafiqun, they are looking for excuses. And when permission is granted to them, they get happy. Right? Because now they don't need to take part in any difficulty. But the believers... When, when they, they are told to stay behind, they don't look for excuses, right? Rather, some of the believers, they would want to go, even if it means they go empty-handed, with no weapons, no ride, nothing. They would still go. But it was a Prophet ﷺ who told them to stay behind because they don't have anything, right? And this is when they would turn away crying because they are sad that they don't have anything that they can spend uh, for this battle. This is how Allah Azawajal concludes the 10th Jews. And the 11th Jews, the beginning is a continuation of this. Allah Azza wa speaks about those, the Bedouins, the Munafiqun who uh, started seeking excuses from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And in particular, Allah Azza wa Jal, he speaks about how the Munafiqun, so Allah Azza wa Jal thereafter goes on to speak about other traits of the Munafiqun, right? Other traits of the hypocrites. And 
one of the things that Allah Azza wa Jal mentions is how they were always hesitant in spending in the path of Allah Azza wa Jal, right? So they didn't want to fight in the path of Allah, obviously, because they're not believers, and they did not want to spend in the path of Allah. So Allah Azza wa Jal is basically telling us, if you want to find out who the munafiqun are, then these are the two traits that they have. They don't want to spend anything, and nor do they want to fight in the path of Allah, right? You will see them coming to the masjid, sitting in the halaqas of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. You will see them asking questions. You will see them here and there. But when it comes to the difficult stuff, like spending from that which you love, and you know sacrificing yourself, going out in the battlefield and fighting for the sake of Allah, this is when their nifaq, their hypocrisy, will come to light. That's why Allah subhanahu wa taala thereafter He talks about how uh, you know there is no toba for such people. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, now he speaks about the believers after this. And he says that the believers are such people that when they commit a sin, when they carry out acts of disobedience, اِعْتَرَفُوا بِذُنُوبِهِمْ yeah, they, they recognize and they admit their wrongdoings. And they make tawbah to Allah azza wa They repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this, what, this is when Allah azza wa says, أَلَمْ يَعْلَمُوا أن الله هو يقبل التوبة عن عباده. That do they not know that Allah Azza wa Jal is the one who accepts tawbah from His servants? Yeah. So this is like a very beautiful verse, and it gives us hope. Anyone that is, what he wants to do tawbah, he wants to repent to Allah Azza wa Jal. This verse is a guarantee from Allah that Allah is the one who accepts tawbah. No one else. You can't go to anyone else to seek repentance. And seek salvation in the hereafter. Only Allah Azza wa is the one who accepts tawbah. And He is the one who yaakhudu sadaqat. He takes sadaqat, meaning He accepts your, your charity as well. Now moving on, Allah Azza wa He speaks about a masjid that the munafiqun erected for, or they built for the purpose of planning and scheming against the Muslims. Right? So the, 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 the munafiqun. They thought, you know, we need, a, we need a meeting spot. A meeting spot in which we can get together, we can make all our plots and our plans against the Muslims, right? And we will disguise it in such a way that it looks like a masjid, right? So we'll, we'll call it a masjid, but the intention that it was built upon was wrong. And this masjid was known as Masjid Dirar. Yeah, Masjid Dirar. So Allah Azza speaks about this in... Verse 107 of Surah Al-Tawbah. Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ اتَّخَذُوا مَسْجِدًا ضِرَارًا وَكُفْرًا وَتَفْرِيقًا بَيْنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَإِرْصَادًا لِمَنْ حَارَبَ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ مِنْ قَبْلِ Allah Azza wa Jalla says that those who take Masjid Dirar as a base for disuniting and causing fitna amongst the believers and as a base for planning to wage war against Allah and His Messenger. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Allah mentions wala yahlifunna in aradna illa al husna they take an oath that we only intended good by building this masjid so they used to go to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and say oh messenger of Allah you know we built this masjid you know come and pray with us as well you know but they were just faking it it was all a show in the next verse Allah azza wa jal straight away he warned the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Allah says la taqum fihi abada لا تقوم فيه أبدا. Don't stand there. Don't even, don't even step foot in that place. Why? Because the masjid was built upon an evil intention, right? Then Allah says, if you really want to go to a masjid and step foot in a masjid and pray in a masjid, Allah says لا مسجد أسس على التقوى من أول يوم أحق أن تقوم فيه. That the masjid that has been established upon taqwa, that is more deserving that you stand in there and you pray in there. And the Mufassili mentioned that this is in reference to Masjid Quba, okay, in uh, outskirts of Medina, okay, and this is why we are, uh, it is Sunnah when you go there, it is Sunnah to pray two raka'at there, um, and the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam spoke about the virtue of doing so, that one who does so, it is as if he has completed and accepted Umrah, right? So if we ever go there, we should try to uh, spend time and go to Masjid Quba, pray two raka'at in Masjid Quba. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in particular on Saturdays, he used to go, he used to walk from Medina to Masjid Quba, from Masjid Nabawi to Masjid Quba, and he used to perform two raka'at there. And he used to meet with the people of Quba, and then he used to return. Sometimes he used to stay multiple days. And we know the role of Masjid Quba in the migration. And when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam migrated from Mecca to Medina, he stayed in Quba for a number of days before entering Medina to Munawwara. 
So this is in reference to Masjid Quba. Now moving on, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the end of Surah At-Tawbah, He speaks about three Sahaba who they stayed back from the Battle of Tabuk. Yeah, three Sahaba, they stayed back from the Battle of Tabuk. One of them was Ka'ab ibn Malik, radiallahu anhu. He was the main one, meaning that he was the most famous out of the three companions, Ka'ab ibn Malik. And what happened was, we mentioned yesterday that there were three types of people who sought excuses to stay back from the Battle of Tabuk. Number one, the Munafiqun, we know this. Number two, those people who had genuine excuses, like the sick and the elderly. And number three, these three companions who had no excuses whatsoever, right? And there's a long hadith, okay, in Bukhari, in Muslim, uh, on the authority of Ka'b ibn Malik himself. And he speaks about this whole incident, right? It's a very, very long hadith. And he speaks about all of the things that he went through and the repercussions that he faced because he stayed back without an excuse. Now, the, the, the summary of the story is this, that we mentioned that the Battle of Tabuk took place in the peak summertime. Now, what happened was, because it was the peak summertime, this is when the fruits become ripe. And this is when, basically, those who are involved in the agricultural business, this is when they'll be making the most money, right? Because they'll be able to sell a lot of products. So now, what he was doing is, he kept on procrastinating, and he, he kept on delaying preparation for the battle. And he kept on leaving it off for tomorrow. He used to go out and he used to be engaged in his business. And then he would come back home and he himself narrates this. He said, I would come back home and I would not have prepared anything for the battle. He said, the next day would come, I would go out. I would be out all day with the intention that I'm going to prepare for the battle now. I would come back having prepared nothing. Kept on delaying it, kept on delaying it. Until, subhanAllah, the Muslim army, they left Medina. Ka'b ibn Malik is still in Medina and he still hasn't prepared anything yet for the long journey ahead. And then he thought, you know what, no problem. My horse is very fast. Yeah, it's not going to take me very long to prepare. I'm going to quickly prepare and I'm going to catch up with the army. Right? But he said that, I'm summarizing the story. He basically said, look, a time came where it was too late for him to even catch the army. I.e., he stayed back now in Medina from the Battle of Tabuk without an excuse, which is a huge, huge thing, right? If jihad has been announced and you don't have an excuse to stay behind, right? You're in big trouble. Yeah, from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and from Allah azza wa jal, okay? The anger of Allah azza wa jal is upon such people. So now what happened was, when the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was traveling to Tabuk, obviously they would stop on the way, they would camp, they would rest. And at one point, he, he was sitting with all of the Sahaba radiallahu anhu. He looked around and he said, where is Ka'ab? I don't see Ka'ab. Now you can imagine, look at the memory of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Look how sharp he is. There's so many Sahaba there, right? Hundreds and hundreds of Sahaba that are there in the Battle of Tabuk, right? If not thousands uh, in the Battle of Tabuk. And he's looking around and he, he's noticing that Ka'ab is not there, right? So he couldn't even get away with it. Right? He couldn't say, oh yeah, you know, I'll, maybe he'll, he, won't, he won't notice that I'm not there. He couldn't even get away with it. He noticed straight away that Ka'b is not there. He asked, started asking the Sahaba, where is Ka'b ibn Malik? Where is Ka'b ibn Malik? So they all said, oh, Messenger of Allah, I don't know where he is. No one knows. Right? So we didn't see him join us. Maybe he's still in Medina. So anyway, the Prophet ﷺ didn't say anything. He left it. After the expedition, they came back to Medina. The Prophet ﷺ enters the Masjid, Masjid Nabawi. And this is when the people who do not come, who did not take part in the battle, they will come and they would start presenting their excuses to the Prophet ﷺ as to why they didn't come. So as usual, the Munafiqun, they were up to no good. They came and they started presenting their fake excuses to Rasulullah ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ knew not to waste any time with them and he just let them go. Then came the turn of Ka'ab ibn Malik and the other two companions, right? The other two companions. And subhanAllah, Ka'ab ibn Malik narrates that I was so embarrassed and I could feel, you know when you can just sense that the vibe is off, right? He said that I could feel that the vibe from the Prophet was off, it was different. What I normally feel when I'm with the Prophet that love, that attention that he gives the Sahaba there was a very negative vibe, right? 
So he said that when I was going and walking to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I was so embarrassed that I had no excuse to present to him that I could not give eye contact to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I was looking down. And he said all the way as I was walking towards the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I had my head down, looking down in shame. And then I sat down. And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam addressed me and he said, Oh Ka'am, why were you missing from the battle? So Ka'am radiallahu anhu, he himself narrating this. And he's saying, he said that I said to myself, when the Prophet asked me this question, I said to myself, I can present such excuses that the Prophet will probably believe me. And the Muslims will definitely believe me. But I fear that Allah Azza wa Jal will send down a revelation exposing my intentions, thereby I will be exposed, and the punishment will be even greater because I lied. So he said I had a choice to make. I could have lied and I could have got away with it. Because he said, I'm very eloquent with my tongue. I could make up any excuse, a very believable excuse I could make up. But he said, you know, I thought, if I lie now, then what's going to happen? The Prophet is going to receive revelation from Allah Azza wa Jal, and my intention is going to be exposed. So he said, O oh, Messenger of Allah. He mentioned the same thing to the Prophet. He said, O oh, Messenger of Allah. If I want to, I could present an excuse to you, a very eloquent excuse, and... You may believe me, but I fear that Allah Azza wa will send down a revelation exposing my intentions. So he said, the truth is, O Messenger of Allah, I have no excuse to present to you. There is no reason why I stayed behind. I got distracted by the dunya. I got distracted by my business. And I procrastinated. I got lazy. And as a result, I could not take part in the Battle of Tabuk. And I have no excuse to present. The other Sahaba, the other two companions, they said the same thing. All right? So the Prophet ﷺ, he said, go away from here until Allah Azza wa decides your affair. And what happened, he commanded all of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum to not speak to Ka'ad ibn Malik, to not deal with him, to basically alienate him from society. This is the difficult bit now, right? This was a punishment that Allah Azza wa gave to Ka'ad ibn Malik and the two companions in the dunya. Yeah, this was the consequences of their actions. That part of their consequences was that no one was speaking to them in society. Just imagine this. No one was speaking to them. So they would walk in the marketplaces and the mates that they would usually have, the friends among the companions, normally they would say, Assalamu alaikum, wa alaikum salam, how's it going, everything okay, you know. No one was speaking. Right? In fact, he mentions that it got so difficult that I thought maybe my best friend will speak to me. He said, I went to my best friend's house and I received that same negative vibe from him as well. He said, it was as if I could not recognize my friend. And then he says that this carried on for 40 days. And after 40 days, what happened was the Prophet ﷺ commanded even their wives to stay away from them, to not engage with, with them in, in terms of intimacy. To, uh, only to, 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 to stay completely away from them, very far away from them, to even move out of their houses. One of the companions, he was quite elderly. So he said to the Messenger of Allah, O oh, Messenger of Allah, or oh, sorry, the wife actually went to the Messenger of Allah and said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, my husband is very old. I need to do khidmah of him. I need to serve him. He cannot function day to day without my help. So the Prophet gave an exception to her, right? So then just imagine, even their spouses, subhanAllah, were told to stay away from them. Now, a total of 50 days passed. So just imagine, this has been going on for, for, for one and a half months of alienation from the society until Allah Azza wa Jal, He revealed these verses in Surah At-Tawbah. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, He speaks about that وَعَلَى الثَّلَاثَةِ الَّذِينَ خُلِّفُوا Allah Azza wa Jal says that most definitely Allah has accepted the tawbah of the three companions who stayed behind. And Allah mentions Himself حَتَّى إِذَا ضَاقَتْ عَلَيْهِمُ الْأَرْضُ بِمَا رَحُبَتْ وَضَاقَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ أَنفُسُهُمْ وَظَنُّوا أَلَّا مَلْجَأَ مِنَ اللَّهِ إِلَّا إِلَيْهِ Allah said that this is what they experienced. Even Allah is saying this. They experienced that they, they, they were alienated so much from society that it was as if the earth became restricted upon them. It was as if they themselves, within themselves, their chest was restricted, restricted upon them. It was almost as if they, as if they were suffocating, right? It was a form of suffocation. And then Allah says, وَظَنُّوا And they started thinking that there is no refuge except in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I.e. they engaged in tawbah. 
sincere tawbah for 50 days, non stop tawbah. And thereafter, Allah Azza wa Jal revealed these verses. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says, Thumma taba alayhim Allah Azza wa Jal accepted their repentance when they repented. Okay? So these were the verses that were revealed. Now, when these verses were revealed, one of the companions, he went on the rooftop. Okay? He went on one of the rooftops of one of the houses. And he started shouting, Oh Ka'ab, Oh Ka'ab, glad tidings, glad tidings. Allah has revealed verses regarding you and your two companions. He kept on saying this. So then Ka'ab ibn Malik, he sensed a, a feeling of relief. He went out. He went to see the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Because imagine, you know the most painful thing was not actually staying away or being alienated from the companions, being alienated from his spouses and his family. The most painful thing for Ka'b ibn Malik was that the messenger of Allah was ignoring him. This was the most difficult. The messenger of Allah was ignoring him. So when Ka'b ibn Malik, he, he even mentioned this, that when I, would, when I would enter the masjid, I would try to get the attention of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa but the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa would turn his face away from me. Yeah? And he says that he mentions one incident that I started praying salah. And he said that in my salah, I was looking at the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa to see that if he looks at me, and I caught him looking at me. And when he saw that I was looking at him, he turned away. In salah. Right? The Prophet turned away. So this is what was the most difficult for Ka'b ibn Malik. That he was being ignored by the messenger of Allah. These, these were people that were willing to sacrifice their lives for the Prophet They loved the Prophet more than themselves. And now the Prophet is ignoring him. So when he received this glad tidings, this announcement that glad tidings for you, O, o Ka'ab, that Allah has revealed verses regarding you, the first person that he wanted to see was not his family, was not his best friend. The first person he wanted to see was Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa He went rush, rushing to the masjid. And he enters the masjid, he sees the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa smiling at him. After 50 days, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa has been ignoring him. And he doesn't know what his fate is. He's thinking that subhanAllah, this could be my end. I'm going to perish like this. Allah's not going to accept my tawbah. I'm doomed to Jahannam. The Messenger of Allah is never going to speak to me again. This is what he was thinking all this time. Now finally, Allah Azza wa Jal lifted the, the, the burden on their shoulders. So when he entered the masjid, he sees the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam smiling at him. And he says that that was the best feeling that I had. When I saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam smiling at me, it was as if all of the burdens that I've been experiencing for 50 days was lifted from my shoulders. Allahu Akbar. And then the Prophet ﷺ recited these verses to Ka'b ibn Malik that Allah Azza wa has forgiven you and accepted your tawbah. The lesson that we learn from this is, many, many lessons we learn, but the main lesson that we learn is that sometimes we may think that lying is the best scenario in a particular situation and that is the best means of escape from that particular situation. But the lesson that we're learning from Ka'b ibn Malik is that if you lie, sometimes if you lie at that moment, the likelihood is that you may be saved in that particular moment, but then it's going to come to haunt you later on, right? It's going to come back. And you may think that you have lied and now, you know, five years has gone past, ten years has gone past, but you never know. That lie sometimes will come back and it will come to haunt you and it will make things even more difficult for you. And on the other hand, truthfulness is such a thing. It may put you in a bit of difficulty for a temporary period of time. But the reality is because you were truthful and you did not engage in a lie. What happens is Allah Azza wa Jal will give you honor. Because now just imagine these three companions till today they are being mentioned for their tawbah. Allahu Akbar. They committed an act of wrong by staying behind from the battle of Tabuk. But because of their tawbah and their truthfulness, look at how Allah Azza wa Jal raised their status. That they're being mentioned in the Quran. And we are remembering for their tawbah. Right? This is the honor that Allah Azza wa Jal gives to people who sincerely repent and who are truthful in their speech. So they were truthful. They went through 50 days of difficulty. But then after that, Allah Azza wa Jal forgave them. Their rank was raised and ease. They experienced ease once again. And things were back to normal. In fact, Things were better than they used to be before because of this honor that Allah Azza wa Jal gave them. This is how Allah Azza wa Jal uh, concludes Surah Al-Tawbah. Right at the end of Surah Al-Tawbah, 
Allah speaks about the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and He mentions that لَقَدَ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِنْ أَنْفُسِكُمْ عَزِيزٌ عَلَيْهِ مَا عَنِتُمْ حَرِيصٌ عَلَيْكُمْ بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ رَأُوفُ الرَّحِيمِ Allah mentions some of the qualities of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam that He is حَرِيصٌ عَلَيْكُمْ بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ or He is حَرِيصٌ عَلَيْكُمْ that He is very passionate for you, for people to believe. And he is Ra'uf and Rahim. He is the compassionate and he is the merciful towards the believer. Right? So these are some of the qualities that Allah Azza speaks about Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Also, Allah once again concludes Surah At-Tawbah by speaking about the Munafiqun. And Allah mentions that وَإِذَا مَا أُنزِلَتْ سُورَةٌ نَظَرَ بَعْضُهُمْ إِلَىٰ بَعْضٍ هَلْ يَرَاكُمْ مِنْ أَحَدٍ ثُمَّ انصَرَفُوا yeah, what, do, what they do is, whenever a surah was revealed, they would get anxious. They would get nervous. They would start looking at each other, the munafiqun. They would start looking at each other. And they would have this fear that maybe this surah will expose us. Maybe we are going to be exposed. Maybe Allah has mentioned the names of us. So now the Prophet ﷺ will know exactly who we are. The Muslims will know who we are and this is our end. So they would get anxious any time a surah was revealed. Because they had this fear that they are going to be exposed. Right? Even though the Prophet ﷺ actually knew who the, who the hypocrites were. Right? And he told... Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman radiyallahu anhu who the hypocrites were. Moving on to Surah Yunus now. Surah Yunus is a Makki Surah and because it is a Makki Surah it deals with the usual themes of Makki Surahs which is uh, Allah Azza wa Jal speaks about the revelation. You know Allah starts Alif Lam Ra Tilka Ayatul Kitab Al-Hakim Allah starts by talking about uh, the Quran and thereafter Allah mentions something particular verse number 2. Verse number two of Surah Yunus is in reference to when the Mushrikeen uh, saw that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has announced that he's a Prophet of Allah. One of the criticisms that they had for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they said that why would Allah choose a man to become a messenger? Yeah, why would Allah choose Muhammad to become a messenger? If Allah wanted to, he, could have, he should have sent down an angel instead. Why a man? It doesn't make sense that a human being is a messenger, right? A messenger should be someone unique, someone special, you know, like an angel. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about this. That, Allah says that are people amazed that we have revealed to a man from amongst them to warn the people and to give glad tidings to the believers, right? And then Allah mentions that the, the disbelievers, what they say is to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that in هذا لساحر مبين. That this man, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he is a clear magician. This is one of the accusations that were thrown towards the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Thereafter, Allah azza wa speaks about his signs in the heavens and the earth. Allah speaks about the nature of man, uh, or the nature of the mushrikeen in particular, how they would ask the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to hasten the punishment. So Allah azza wa says. وَلَوْ يُعَجِّلُ اللَّهُ لِلنَّاسِ That if, the, if Allah Azza wa Jal hastened for the people evil, the same way He hastened good for them, then none of them would have been alive right now. Right? All of them would have been destroyed. However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He has delayed their destruction, their punishment for them. Perhaps they may turn back to Him. Perhaps they may take heed. So this is something that Allah Azza wa Jal speaks about. Thereafter, Allah speaks about the nature of man. This is a verse that we must listen to very carefully. The nature of man. Allah Azza wa he says, obviously this is in reference to the mushrikeen, but we can apply it to everyone, any one of us. That, وَإِذَا مَسَّ الْإِنسَانَ الضُّرُّ دَعَانَا لِجَنْبِهِ أَوْ قَاعِدًا أَوْ قَائِمًا That when harm afflicts man, he calls us, he supplicates to us, he makes dua to us, lying down, standing and sitting. فَلَمَّا كَشَفْنَا عَنْهُ ضُرَّهُ when we remove harm from him, he carries on with his life as if nothing happened. He carries on with his life as if he did not make dua for us the first time. Now, subhanAllah, how many people do this? When things get difficult, often people, what do they do when things get difficult? They start making dua, they come to the masjid, they will start crying to Allah, جل, which is all good. But sometimes Allah جل, gives you evil to wake you up. Not so that you can call Allah Azza wa until that evil goes away and then you go back to your previous ways, right? You're meant to make a change in your life. So there are many people who, 
they live a life of sin and disobedience and negligence. And then what happens is when things get difficult, they turn to Allah, they start making dua, they start praying their salah, and they'll make dua to Allah Azza wa day and night. Then as soon as that problem goes away, what happens? They start ignoring Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they go back to their previous ways. They start neglecting all of their salahs, right? This is not the attitude of a believer. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning these qualities in reference to the mushrikeen. So this is what he's mentioned. Thereafter, at the end of the, the 11th juz, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the stories of the prophets. In particular, Allah speaks about the story of Nuh alayhi salam as well as Musa alayhi salam. And this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, concludes uh, the 11th juz of the Quran. Uh, one more verse that Allah azza wa jal speaks about that I would like to highlight is the verse where Allah azza wa jal, he speaks about how he is calling the believers towards Darus Salam. Yeah, Allah says, Wallahu yad'u ila Darus Salam. That Allah calls you towards the abode of peace, meaning Jannah. Yeah, so this is a call from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Where shaitan, he calls you towards evil. He calls you towards the doors of Jahannam. Right, so when we hear verses like this, that Allah azza wa is calling you to Darus Salam, the abode of peace, to Jannah, what should be the attitude of the believers? The attitude of the believer is that are you going to respond to that call? Yeah, Allah is calling you to Jannah. Allah is saying, come to Jannah. This is the path. Allah guides whomever He wishes. Allah gives opportunities to the believers to gain Jannah. Now, part of responding to that call of Allah Azza wa Jal is to recognize those opportunities like Ramadan. Yeah, Ramadan is an opportunity. Ramadan is a manifestation of how Allah is calling us to Jannah. The very fact that we are witnessing Ramadan, that we fast, that we can fast, that we can stand in Qiyam, that we can give Sadaqah, that we can spend time reciting the Quran, learning the Quran, we can sit in halaqas like this. This is a manifestation of how Allah Azza wa Jal, He wants us to enter Jannah, right? But the question is, are we going to respond to this call? Or are we going to, when Ramadan comes to an end, we're going to go back to our previous ways, right? So this is something that we need to think about. And this is how Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala He ends the 11th Jews of the Quran. Allah speaks about, you know, the story of Nuh alayhi salam, the story of Musa alayhi salam. And thereafter, we have the completion of the 11th juz. And the 12th juz, it starts off with Surah Hud, which inshaAllah, we will speak about tomorrow. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the tawfiq. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barakatuh ala ibn Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. MashaAllah, a lot of brothers sleeping.